So um, our next speaker, uh, keynote for NetDev, um, doesn't need a lot of introduction. I I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. Uh, <clears throat> Internet Hall of Famer. Um, I'm not allowed to say he saved TCP, uh, but <clears throat> obviously had a lot of influence on congestion control algorithms. Um, but actually, for me, what he's no most known for, um, when I started working at Sun, um, quite a bit of time ago, I was working on this protocol called PPP, and there was this uh, funny thing, band, or VJ compression, and VJ compression, so that's kind of interesting, I, I never knew what the VJ stands for. Turns out it's Van Jacobson, and so to me that's pretty cool. Somebody um, actually having a, a major algorithm or a protocol named after them, very rare in this industry, so that's pretty impressive to me. Um, but anyway, uh, so I think um, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Van Jacobson. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I hope this won't put you to sleep. Um, I, I want to... Uh, try and convince you that we should make some small changes to the contract between protocols and NICs. And if we do that, it will solve a lot of problems. Uh, I'm gonna try and motivate the small changes by uh, talking about the history for why it is the way it is. Because a lot of design decisions in TCP IP weren't made because there was only one right way to do things and the designers hit on that way after a bunch of discussion. Many parts of the design came from that, but many parts of the design came from historical accidents. There was something that had been tried and uh, worked, so they copied it, or something had been tried and failed, so they did something different. It's not that they knew one true way because internet, TCP IP didn't exist yet. Um, it was a search of the space and context matters a lot. So going all the way back to the beginning, uh, dark ages of networking, this is what the word networking meant in 1970s. Uh, this was IBM's product announcement for their brand new network architecture that became known as SNA. And if you look at it, it's got a lot of printers and terminals on it. And that's what networking was. Sitting up in the left-hand corner, there's a mainframe. They sold mainframes. They were fabulously expensive. Only really high-end enterprises could afford to buy them. They wanted to move down market. But to do that, they had to meet, say, smaller banks with a few branch offices in order to get those customers, they had to be able to give connectivity to the branch offices, and they couldn't. They were all designed around data centers, a few channels, real expensive peripherals sitting within about uh, 100 feet of the computer. And so they designed some remote controllers uh, that would drive their display controllers and said, oh, you can put this in your branch office, you can talk back to the mainframe in your central office, got a dozen branch offices, the cost of the whole system is way less because you divide it by 12. Uh, so they go, cool. Lots of banks, financial services, retail outlets, they all went to buy these things. Uh, so great sales pitch. This was a network. The way that you build this network is first, you're trying to sell hardware. You're a big computer company you don't want your customers to be able to use your competitor's gear. You know, rule one is lock in your customers. Uh, so if you think that the basis of networking is let's help the world communicate, let's let everything talk to everything else. That's a great fantasy world, but that wasn't the world at the beginning. The objective was exactly the opposite. It was make sure that our customers can only talk to our stuff and nothing else connects. 
And because they're trying to sell more hardware and they're trying to fill a hole in their product line of they don't have terminals in the places that they want them, the people that were in charge of the project were the engineers who made terminals and printers, the peripherals that the customers would see. Because obviously that's the important part of the objective. The communication part is whatever is necessary to make the display work or make the printer work. And lastly, be really, really sure that you lock in those customers, our peripherals end to end, everything. So the upshot of that is you get engineers who made the peripherals driving the design and what was important to them became the top priority objectives. What that meant is when you're making protocols, the device artifacts were stuck right in the protocol with all of the weirdness that you normally get from communication. Like if there's a printer that takes two pages to eject, a, or takes two seconds to eject a page, in the low level communication protocol, you put an eject page command and when you send that command down, you know to wait two seconds. It's written so that you get the page delay in the transport protocol because there's not much smarts and not much memory. You know, memory at these days was still core and relays. Fabulously expensive, there wasn't much of it. Uh, you were sending things over dead slow communication links, a lot of 300 baud links for their retail customers, uh, 2000 baud, 2.4K for the financial customers. And if you were really, really rich, you'd get 56 kilobits. That was the upper end of bandwidth, which means that you try to make the headers really small and it's always good not to say something like, yes, I got that packet. You don't want to say that. Assume it was right and there are various device timeouts that will tell you if you got it wrong. And you're winding your way through this really high ad hoc mixture of controllers that were hung on I.O. channels that were never meant to be communication channels. They were really meant for a mainframe to talk to disks or printers. Uh, they had smart channel programs, but smart in the sense they could talk well to devices, not to communication lines. And because of that, you had layers of encapsulation that migrated you through those controllers, but the encapsulation depended on which particular model of controller and what its function was in the system, which meant every different thing that you talked to had a different packet format because it required different encapsulations. So this is a recipe for disaster, and it was. I mean, it took uh, 15 years to get rolled out. Important pieces went out early, but uh, most of it showed up in industry articles saying SNA when. Um, it was contemporaneous with the IPTCP design, again, early to mid 70s. Uh, the designers of the internet architecture could look over and see what was happening in SNA. Enough of it hadn't rolled out to uh, supply lessons learned, but there were things that you could s see that said, this is really not the way that you want to do it. You want to focus not on what's using the network, but making the network usable. You don't want to build in the problems that you're solving. You want to make a toolbox that will solve a whole variety of problems. In order to make that shift, the architecture emphasizes simple. If you can't justify something, throw it out. And everybody has to agree it's unambiguously useful before you leave it in. You want really expressive abstractions, things that will solve a lot of problems. Um, but they want to have implementable APIs, contracts between one level and the next, uh, because a lot of things sound good in theory, but you go to do it and the world's more complicated than that or doesn't like you to do it that way. And almost everybody that was on the architecture team had implemented protocols already. They'd already worked on the ARPANET, knew about how reality interferes with your beautiful designs. Uh, so we know they made 
two main protocols, uh, the IP part, interface to interface small messages, based on an unreliable best effort delivery. I want to say a little bit about best effort much later. Um, that doesn't, you know, when the computer vendors doing their own networks saw that spec for IP, they said, oh yeah, this is the hippie protocol. It says, hey, I may deliver your, pro your packet or I may go surfing. And you, know, you take your chances. That's not what best effort meant. The network has nothing to do but deliver packets. And if it can't deliver your packet, it's because there are other packets that are in the way or there's some sort of resource contention that stops it. So best effort is not laissez-faire. It's focused on the problem, doing everything possible to make this happen, but uh, things fail. Be prepared to deal with it. Uh, TCP protocol on top of that contract saying, all right, given your best effort, I can turn that into reliable eventual delivery. Eventual is important. You can't say when because you don't know what's going to fail. Uh, and you may have to retry. That's pretty much it. It was a couple of short RFCs because they left a whole bunch out. They pretty much left out everything that was in SNA and everything that made it impossible to implement. Uh, they don't talk about the intended applications. There was no concern about protocol efficiency. The headers said what they needed to say in clear ways by alignment. Uh, not a lot of overloading, not a lot of compression. Uh, as Tom said, many years afterwards, I did some TCP header compression. It's easy to compress redundant information out. It's really hard to put non-existent information back. So st starting with a focus on making the header small means you're highly probable to leave out something important and you can't get it back later. Uh, so they made some nice decisions. One of them led to the data delivery model is in TCP, which is an as fast as possible model. It comes about because all that you say at the TCP contract is I do reliable delivery. Um, and implicitly, because the reliability requires you hold on to data at both ends, that puts a bound on how much can be sent because you can only send as much as both ends are willing to buffer. Uh, it can only be as much unacknowledged as both ends are willing to buffer. But this says nothing about how fast you can go. If it's not said, it's left up to the implementation. And the standards are really careful to say nothing about implementations. They say it's implementable. We did it once like this. You can copy it. You can do something better. That's really cool. Uh, the reference implementation used a queue on the interface output. The protocol stack dumped packets into the queue. The interface pulled packets out of the queue. And basically, you ran as fast as the interface let you. And that's what defined as fast as possible. The amount that was in flight was determined by the minimum of either a limit on that queue, you know, typically 100 to 1,000 packets, or the receive window, which in these days was two, four, eight kilobytes, small number of packets. Um, the big issue is if you do it that way, the rate constraint, how fast things go, is entirely a local constraint because it's determined by the rate that you're sending packets to the local interface. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the network at this point because it's upstream of the interface. Um, so if your interface will accept a million packets at a gigabit, as fast as possible as a million packets at a gigabit, uh, that's a beloved work conserving architecture, which is easy to analyze, but kind of deadly in practice. But if you're starting a protocol from nothing, it's a really good starting point 
because if you're successful with your network and it gets used, it'll get faster because it's being used, it's getting full. The only way to get more data through it and get more use is to speed up the interfaces. It was really successful. Uh, it drove a lot of evolution in our communication interfaces. So this is 25 years of Ethernet evolution. Um, that blue line is the Moore's Law line, doubling every 18 months. And Ethernet, you know, if we look over the entire 25 years, it's exactly on top of the Moore's Law line. It evolved as fast as anything. So, unlike a lot of other protocols that were built for particular communication lines or particular bandwidth hierarchies like the telcos, T-carrier hierarchy, they all had speeds built into them. There was no speed built in anywhere in TCP IP. It was one of the first things that got left out. Uh, and because of that, the speed's externally determined, and if you change the entity that's controlling it, you change the interface speed, then everything magically goes faster. And this evolution was surprisingly painless. I mean, you had to tune things when you went a lot faster, but at least uh, for the first step up to about uh, gigabit ethernet, it's just absolutely painless. But there's issues with running as fast as possible. Some of them are first principle issues. Um, queuing theory says that if you decide to run your bottlenecks at 100%, then if you get a backlog, there's no way to get rid of it. Because a queue's uh, a balance between an arrival process and a departure process. At a bottleneck, you've got a deterministic departure process that runs at the bottleneck link rate. If the arrivals are the bottleneck link rate, whenever they go slightly above, you get extra stuff in the queue because you were going faster than the departure rate. But the departure rate's deterministic and fixed, and so you can't get rid of that stuff. So all the queues that you make, any little gaps that build up little transient backlogs, they all make queues that live forever. And so this is for the best case queuing system, Poisson arrivals, deterministic service. Um, everything else is gonna be worse. You know, uh, Poisson's as nice as traffic can possibly be. The left hand edge of the graph is what happens to the delay in terms of packet time as you approach 100% utilization of the bottleneck link. It hockey sticks and skyrockets. Uh, the right-hand graph is how that looks on a log graph. And it's kind of intuitive there. It says that if you're at really low traffic rates, um, there's basically no queue. You, you just sail right through. As the queue gets up towards, uh, or the rate gets up towards 50% busy, the probability that you see one packet in front of you starts to get re really high. That's when you get to one. So one pack of time will wait. It's more or less linear until you get up above 90% and then it takes off. Uh, and it takes off really fast. Now, if the right hand edge is your operating point, you've got something that's really fabulously brittle. Um, and the fabulously brittle may be somewhere where it's hard to deal with it, like nine hops away from you in a poorly buffered switch, or at some ISP's connection to some user's home. Again, is poorly buffered because they want, went really cheap on that switch. Uh, so this is sort of a recipe for problems. Um, now, it wasn't a recipe for problems early on. It, memory was super expensive. Links were super slow. What that meant is the delay bandwidth product was tiny. Um, it was kilobytes, small kilobytes, you know, like less than 10. Um, 
if you were inside a campus, if you were close, well, the RTT was small and it was 10 to 100 megabit connections, that's not enough to, you know, all you pay for is store and forward delays, but you can't store many bits in a wire in, if you're that close. So you're within the sort of 10 kilobyte-ish range. Uh, if you're going long haul, telco is charged up the wazoo for bandwidth. So again, BDPs are small because the bandwidth is small. Uh, so for a long time, up to at least 1995, the first issue said, ah, you know, AFAP, no issue. We're, we're never, we can't build big enough queues to cause a problem. So even though there's a hockey stick, it's not affecting us. Uh, past 95, router vendors started to make a lot of memory selling router buffers uh, at a real 65% premium in memory price. Uh, but if you put a router with a bandwidth delay product worth of buffering in front of every potential bottleneck, then you're also not going to have an issue. You can dump your packets into the router and it will deal with them. And you've got to stop because you've got a BDP in flight. So uh, again, non-problem. Uh, lastly, you can have the telco style shape bandwidth architecture. So you can have, say, your host links run at 10 gig, but the things that they talk to, the first level switches or aggregation boxes are running at 100. You upgrade the host to 100 gig, you upgrade the switches to a gig. Host to a gig, switches 10 gig. You can always stay a step ahead, then it doesn't matter that the hosts are sending as fast as possible because as fast as possible can only get one hop away from the host and then it's in a fatter pipe. And so now you got room and things can sort themselves out. So these second two issues you know, from shortly before the millennium through about 2012, they basically saved our ass. You, know, you were doing one or the other and uh, we weren't seeing these massive queues. We did start to see massive, massive buffer bloat because the packets have to get queued somewhere. And if it's the second option, that's in a downstream router. Memory is fairly cheap and it makes a lot of money for the router vendor. So you get multi-second queues even in multi-gigabit routers. Uh, kind of painful. Past 2012, uh, the pain started to increase and there was a technology reason for that. If you look in more detail about the ethernet scaling, there's clearly two lines in the data and they're different. There's an early time up to about 2000 where it's doubling time was uh, fifty percent better than Moore's law. The the rate over that twenty years was uh, double every twelve months rather than every eighteen. For the next two generations, for the t ten gig and our current uh, approach to a hundred gig, uh, that was way harder. There, the spacing between generations wasn't. 18 months, it was 24. It took at least two years to get each new generation out. And that kind of broke this nice sort of TikTok thing we had going in campuses and data centers where uh, you would uh, upgrade your fabrics to the latest generation of NICs because there aren't all that many switches compared to hosts. There are you know, 10 times more leaves than there are network nodes with even small fan out from your switches. So that it means it's upgrading switches is high leverage. The switches got the fast interfaces first. So when the one gig standard was published, there were a whole bunch of switch and router boxes that had one gig interfaces. They weren't on the motherboard of any server uh, weren't on the motherboard of any host, so you had all of your server infrastructure that was running 10 times slower than the switches. Cool. 
when you got your servers updated, when the uh, new one gig interfaces started to be standard on the motherboards, or orderable on motherboards, or cheap NICs, upgrade your entire compute, then about that time, the next standard would be published, and suddenly you had new switch offerings that went at 10 gig, not at one gig. So you, you get a cycle of alternate upgrades that for the most part kept the fabric ahead of the hosts until one generation suddenly took a lot longer than anybody thought it would take, and it was a lot more expensive than anybody would, thought it would be. And that caused the switches to catch up with the hosts, or the hosts to catch up with the switches. Now everything's running at the same speed, and now there's a lot of AFAP issues, because now you can get that hockey stick anywhere in your fabric, almost certainly downstream of the host, but anywhere when where multiple active hosts come together and try and talk to the same output port issues. So um, this is a bunch of Google published papers, and uh, I was desperately trying to finish slides at three in the morning, and I didn't turn all of these into links yet, but I'll do that before uh, I upload the copy of the slides. Um, I picked Google Papers uh, not for any corporate agenda, it's just I, I know about this work, I know its context, um, why it was done, and the problems it addressed. Um, and uh, it's representative of things that were happening throughout networking, both other data center computing and edge networking. Everybody was seeing the same issues. They're driven by the same core problem. If you remember, the world really changed in uh, between 2000 and 2005 because we've been used to processors doubling their speed uh, every 18 months. And then suddenly, uh, around 2003, Intel says, well, the next generation of Pentium uh, is not going to be two times faster. It's actually going to be a little bit slower, but there will be more of them on the die. We'll, we'll give you two or four, because we can't make it any faster, because we can't move the electrons in silicon any faster than they're already moving. You know, we put a field on them, tell them to go left, and before they can start to move, we reverse the field and tell them to go right. You know, that's what high-speed signaling is all about. Uh, when that happens, then you can't do logic anymore because you don't have currents anymore. Uh, and it happens at a couple of gigahertz in silicon. It doesn't have really high electron mobility. So because we hit that wall, we could still put lots of transistors on the chip, so we had to do more in parallel. It doesn't do any good to do one CPU in parallel, but you can put a lot more CPUs, let them work in parallel. Uh, you can get around the same wall at the application level by spreading out your computations. We used to be solving problems by saying, uh, oh, we really would like this to go faster. Okay, you know, wait six months, buy a new CPU, it'll be twice as fast. You know, early 2000, that no longer worked. And so, because we'd hit this wall in silicon that affected both networking and computation, but it affected networking worse. One was we didn't get the bandwidth hierarchy in our fabrics that let us prevent these problems from happening. Secondly, because we had to distribute the computations a lot more, we put a lot more stress on the network. Something that would have been handled by a CPU upgrade, which has zero impact on the network, the links that are connecting it to your fabric, still the same link. Now you can't do it with a CPU upgrade, you have to do it with another rack, uh, more CPUs. Big impact on the network, completely different application structure, huge multiplier on the traffic, and issues. So uh, we saw pain in our fabric, as talked about a bit in the Jupiter paper in SIGCOM 15. We saw a lot of pain on our 
WAN, internal WAN infrastructure before. It's talked about a, lit, uh, a little bit in the SICCOM 13 paper that describes that. Uh, more details on the problems and the mitigations are in that bottom set of papers, starting back with the uh, whole paper, which is all about spreading traffic out so as fast as possible becomes 95% rather than 100%. If you look at how that hockey stick goes in bandwidth, if you back off just a little bit, you get a huge win. There's no benefit in backing off a lot because it's really flat. But if you can back off a little bit from 100%, your delays and queues, drops, all go to almost zero. So uh, a Stanford Google paper said, why don't we do that? Uh, be we, you're heavily sharing WAN links. That means there's a lot of traffic converging on them. Uh, that means that a lot of stuff can uh, get dropped. Really hard to get TCP to open its window if you've got lots of drops. So you try to do traffic management on the end house. You're making a fabric or a WAN out of switches that have 0.1% of BDP buffer. I mean, they're basically unbuffered switches. Uh, you're sending them lots of stochastic traffic. If it happens to be correlated, then you lose big because there's no buffer to fix it in the switch. Uh, so the only option you've got, the only place where there is buffer is at the originating host. So BWE is all about how you fix things at the originating host because you can no longer fix them in the network. Uh, similar thing, FQ pacing. Uh, Eric Dumazay's beautiful QDisk that would give you really good traffic mixing uh, by FQing uh, Ron Robin FQ on all the active sockets, which gives you really high entropy going up the link as opposed to big bursts from different connections. You need really high entropy in a fabric because if you don't, you get head of line blocking. A switch can only send the packets it sees. If all the packets it sees have the same destination, they're all going to follow the same path. That path will be congested. And you can't use downstream alternates. Uh, you, you can't keep a lot of paths busy in parallel unless there's enough mixing in the traffic to support that. You have to do that on the edge. And there's no buffer in the switches that would make it possible. Traffic's just flowing through. Uh, other things on the theme. Uh, Looking at the queues building up in the data center, that's timely. Uh, trying to pace them, spread them out. Looking at queues building up on the customer access link, the final tail, uh, that's BBR. These are all, if you look at this arc that's uh, six years long, it's all the same theme. It's saying, let's back away from this AFAP, you know, this local, we're conserving, ship the packets downstream as quick as you can, because it's going to hurt if we do that. Instead, let's try to figure out what's the slowest thing downstream. What's the bottleneck link that re really determines what's as fast as possible? And it's never local, right? You can't congest your uplink to the Tor. It's, it runs as fast as it runs. It's what's setting your rate. So. There's no way that the current model could help solve the AFAP, you know, 100% model could help solve the problem because the problem's not local and it is local. You have to know what's happening downstream and you have to figure it out some way. And most of these things are about figuring that out and then using that to set your delivery rate locally so that you're not putting pressure on downstream buffers. The last one uh, is the one I really want to highlight, and it's sort of the subject of the pitch here. Um, the current way we're doing AFAP, it doesn't work. It really can't work. It can't work anywhere. It doesn't work well in home routers. Uh, it doesn't work well in data center routers it, it, or switches. Uh, it, it's not sufficiently constrained. It's looking at the wrong thing. Um, we need something that allows us 
a more nuanced control. The bottlenecks are remote. That means they're not one size fits all. You can't look at your NIC and say, oh, you're a gig. That's how fast I'll give you packets. Or um, I will go as fast as my NIC wants to go. It doesn't matter how fast your NIC wants to go. What matters is how fast the bottleneck wants to go. And that's different for different sets of traffic. And you need to figure it out. And when you figure it out, you need to act on it so that you don't put too much pressure on it. Uh, here, we're dealing with lots of different traffic aggregates, not flows, whatever they happen to be. This is like all the packets that are going over the WAN link, all the packets are going up to my tour, all the packets that are going to that server, lots of collections, and many different collections simultaneously and packets participating in multiple connections. If, uh, BBR is looking at a bottleneck that's on uh, some uh, DSL tail going out to a user. It's picking a packet rate based on that. All of those user connections are being collected into one group that's going over a particular fiber color across the WAN. And that color can only handle about uh, two gigabits per second of additional traffic. So there's a shaper at the host that says, all right, everything destined for that WAN color can only go two gigabits per second. And then finally, there's some link that says, and I can only go 10 gig per second. So you get the composition of those different constraints and each constraint with different packets in it. You need a mechanism that would let you express that uh, from the protocol stack all the way out. The carousel paper in uh, SIGCOM 17 was such a mechanism, and it's pretty simple. The core idea is uh, you get rid of the picture that we have today, which is a bunch of packet streams. They get classified, shoved into a bunch of queues, which set the policy for that particular collection of packets. So we have things like the protocol figuring out how fast a particular color of traffic should go here, one particular flow or connection. Uh, but in addition to the color, packets are aggregated different ways, like this is WAN traffic, this is uh, traffic to a slow downstream ISP. That goes into different queues, which all have different shaping rates. There's a service discipline pulling packets off those queues as they're allowed to be sent, and then sending them down to a NIC. Uh, so, I mean, that works. Not very flexible, hard to set up. Uh, if instead you say, this is all about figuring out when packets can go in the wire, if we put a timestamp in the packet that gives the earliest legal departure time for this packet, the way that we then shape it is send it through a bunch of policy blocks, sort of the equivalent of the uh, fair queuing shapers uh, or uh, going black, uh, the various shaping subsystems in Linux QDIS, but you don't need the Q part. Uh, what you do is look at the traffic and say, okay, based on the packets that have recently gone through me, the next time I can accept a packet is time X. And I look in the packet, the packet says, has a time in it, and the time is after X. Says, cool, you can go, because you're not constrained by my shaper. So it lets the packet go through, and then it updates the next packet's departure time. Or it looks in the packet, the packet has some timestamp that's less than the next departure time. So you say, oh, you can't go until time X. And so you replace the timestamp in the packet with X, and you send it on towards the NIC. It's purely computational, because rather than queuing things, you're changing the timestamp. It has the same effect. It's going to determine when the packet hits the wire. But it means that the packets all flow through. Uh, so you move the scheduling state from being implicit in the structure of a queue and having a long concatenation of queues to explicit as a field in the XKB. So it, 
moves with the packet, and then it's implemented by a single scheduler that's sitting right up in front of the NIC. Uh, so, why would you do that? Well, it's a superset of what a queue does. It's functionally equivalent. It'll do everything that a queue does, uh, but it will do some additional stuff. When it's doing what a queue does, it does it faster. Queues and timing wheels are both order one, um, but in a queue, you've got packets linked to other packets, so when you're moving packets onto and out of the queue, you're taking additional cache misses. You not only have the packet you're dealing with, which is hot in the cache, but you've also got the packet you've got to link it to, which is probably not hot in the cache. Uh, and since they're double-ended queues, you're linking forward and backwards. So you get additional memory traffic in a queue that you don't have in a timing wheel. It's not only cache-friendly, but it's also RCU-friendly. You know, for pretty much the same reasons. There's a single slot packet gets laid in a slot in this linear structure. That's made for RCU. You can read it lock-free, uh, which means you can figure out the constraints uh, super cheap. And uh, you can use the RCU update, also make it lock-free, uh, fairly minimal cost because it's a single slot. Uh, you get to choose the length of the timing wheel, and unlike the length of a queue, you can choose a physically meaningful length because it's in time, and what you want in the length of a queue is something that amortizes time, right? What uh, BQL is all about is estimating how much interrupt latency and bus latency is between the QDUS subsystem, the driver's initial input uh, output routine, and the device all the way to packet completion. So you want to queue enough downstream to the device to cover that latency, but very little more, because anything you push downstream, you've lost control of. Uh, you're saying, oh, the network's going to have to figure out what to do about these packets because I can't reorder things. I can't mix them up once I push them downstream. So BQL says, well, I can figure out how much latency I've got to cover. I won't let any more packets go downstream then we'll cover that latency plus you know, a little bit of extra room. That happens automatically in a timing wheel because it's time. Uh, which is what you're trying to cover when you're trying to mask a latency. Uh, so you can set the length of the timing wheel if it takes 10 microseconds to get an interrupt, set it to 20 microseconds. That will keep things 100% busy uh, while keeping a minimum queue. You can set it to a little bit longer, uh, but again, you lose control of the packets if you push them downstream, and your caches stop working if you push things downstream because the things that are closest to the NIC are things that haven't been touched in a long time, which means that they've been flushed from the cache, even though they were initially built in the cache. Uh, so uh, you can easily get packets, like you start a map reduce and suddenly 50,000 processes do the uh, reduce step, so they want to send their results. Uh, so huge influx of data. Uh, you start to queue those as soon as you've hit the event horizon. You know because you're keeping track of how the time on the wire has been allocated. Basically, the timing wheel is a picture of the time on the wire. Uh, you know that you've got all that you can handle, uh, so you can either propagate an error back up to the sender saying, you've asked me to send something too far in the future, or more likely, you can put a call back on a second level timing wheel, one that's working on time scales that are multiples of the event horizon time, and say, okay, at this point in the future, you will be eligible to send, and I will give you a call back uh, so that you can inject your packet then. So this is a TSQ-like mechanism. Um, 
that kind of callback already exists for the TCP small Q's limit, but unlike TSQ, you've now got a meaningful bound on it. TSQ only lets a flow put in three packets, but if you've got 50,000 flows, that's still a honking big Q. Uh, here, you can only put in whatever the horizon is, a millisecond worth of packets. The rest of it's handled by a callbacks. They're all event-driven, so there's not a lot of polling or other infrastructure associated with it. Uh, and because the horizon puts a hard bound on the active output bytes, the you know it's the hard bound is nick rate times whatever the horizon time is. That's uh, bytes per second times seconds equals bytes is a, a bandwidth delay product. Um, that's a hard bound on how far in time uh, the oldest packet sent to the NIC is. If it's short with high probability, that's still sitting in L3 cache because that's where it was built, which means that if you've got a system that can DMA from L3, it runs out of cache rather than running out of memory. So things speed up. Uh, if you've got this model, QDISC get really easy because they don't hold packets anymore. They're purely computational. Um, you just push them through. You update the QDISC state that says, all right, what's the next time stamp that I enforce? But that's it. Uh, what that means is a win for both ends. The driver gets to see all the packets because that's where the queue is. And so drivers right now, like Wi-Fi, where you have to turn off QDIS because the driver needs to aggregate packets. And it will try to defeat any QDIS you put in front of it by pulling packets too early so that it can see them to aggregate by destination. Well, now, all the drivers get to see all of the packets as soon as possible, as soon as they're shipped. So they can do really efficient aggregation. They now work with the QDIS rather than against them. Um, they call the library routine that implements the timing wheel, but that's it. At the other end, when you're doing a send, send calls through all of the QDIS, all of the constraints. Every one of them looks at the packet according to its constraint rules, updates the timestamp. When you get done and the packet is queued, the timestamp in that SKB says when this packet is going to hit the wire. So the sender, the thing at the send call, when the send call returns, it says, oh, this packet tells me that it's not going to go on the wire for 100 milliseconds, and I don't want to wait that long. I'm going to use plan B. Um, it now knows as early as possible what the implications of its send are when uh, the send is going to happen, and so it can be smart about that. It can either adapt the delay if it's thing that's concerned about phase and inner packet times, uh, or it can punt information up to applications saying, this is going to take a long time if you've got an alternate to do it. Uh, so this is working because you're making a picture of packets on the wire. I mean, it's really direct implementation in memory simulation of what you're trying to accomplish. And what that means is any pattern of packets on the wire that you have a reason to construct, this mechanism can make it, can put it there for you. That's really unlike queues. They have big constraints on the kind of queuing mechanisms you've got. Um, there's a particular one that we've wanted for years, sort of ever since Nandita's thesis, saying, look, the metric you really want to optimize in service and transactional systems is completion rate, not fairness. Because if you've got two multi-party transactions, if you schedule them interleave, they both finish at the same time. Uh, that's fair, but if you were to send all of one and then all of the other, that first one is going to finish in half the time. Second one's going to finish in the same time as if you mix them together. So you've reduced the total service time by at least 25% because 
one finishes in time one and the other finishes at time two. Uh, potentially a lot more than that if the transactions, as soon as they arrive, they can be processed. If you do fair, you're causing everything to arrive at once, which means you hold off all the processing until everything is there. Maximizes the memory pressure, minimizes the parallelism. It's really stupid. So we'd like to use service policies for transactional uh, traffic to keep all of a transaction together, but round robin among transactions. You can't express that with any existing queue disk. I, it's just no way to say it because only the app knows about transactions. It's really easy to express the timing wheel. You just put the same timestamp on all of the packets for one transaction. It says, all these guys are one unit. They all go together. Carry through, it all works. You move the first one, they all move. So that's all I had to say. Uh, small change, right? Throw away a queue, put in a timing wheel, functionally equivalent. Put another field in packets, got a timestamp. Queue just gets simpler, system gets more capable, it's faster. Uh, so, you know, I'm voting, why don't we do it? We can do it in Linux, it's really hard in other systems, but Linux is like built for this. So, thank you. Thank you. So, okay, we, we're gonna do this slightly different. If you have a question, line up with the mics instead. It's a lot easier than running around. Yeah, sure. Hi, Mia Kulevind. Um, thank you for the presentation, really interesting. I think um, now you have like reduced the problem you had previously to a problem where you need to define the right interface between the socket API and the policy scheduling API, whatever, which might be also challenging. Any ideas? Uh, I mean, interfaces are easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's Already, uh, you know, I, I hate the socket interface. I was you know, there at creation time. I was part of the Berkeley Unix group. Uh, uh, and I wish we could have uh, done it better, but we've lived with it. The way that we've moved it into the future is via sock ops. So there's 60 gazillion sock ops and things that we can put in sock ops, we put in message send or send message tags. Uh, so there are already tags that let you do per packet rates that could easily be tags that let you do per packet timestamps that let you cross the boundary from apps to kernel, preserving the apps intent on the time structure of the traffic, so it can say things like transactions, or if you're doing a protocol like Quick that uh, is uh, trying to in enforce bottleneck, uh, you know, tail bandwidth constraints, it can say, "Oh, these packets need to be this far apart." Uh, at the other end, if rather than doing a timing wheel in software, which is really problematic, if uh, you 100 gig, you've got sub-microsecond packets, that's really not software timing space. Uh, and you like to run at 95%, which is fairly fine grain. NICs already have timers in them. The protocol, the contention protocol on an Ethernet requires that they be able to back off at uh, small times compared to packet times. So in, in the NIC, you can easily put the timing wheel you have to agree on conventions between the two ends, but that doesn't mean synchronized clocks because these departure timestamps are just a relationship between two packets uh, from the same source. And because it's a difference, the clock offset doesn't matter at all, which means both from application level and across hardware boundaries, when the downstream is accepting packets from a particular descriptor ring, a particular source, uh, it has to keep associated with that ring a clock offset from the timestamps 
in that source to its local clock. It can set the offset when it gets the first packet and then just use it to map the timestamps uh, from whatever the source clock was to its local clock as it gets each new timestamp. And if uh, it doesn't get packets for a long time, it resets and picks a new offset. So you can make a really lightweight coordination protocol that's not like a time sync protocol uh, that enforces the timing constraints but works across boundaries where clock synchronization is really approximate or undesirable. I hope that answers the question. A little bit. I was more thinking about like how to, there must be a step where you have like application intents or whatever or socket intents that, trans that transfers this information into a timestamp, basically. I, and yeah, so we're, the model is we're just annotating the packets. So it's packet by packet, but rather the implicitly declaring the departure order by handing the packet to the interface at the time that we want it to go out. Uh, we're explicitly declaring the separation between packets, which means that we can present them early, uh, and we can present them in larger units and one at a time. Uh, and because it's per packet annotation, at least in socket interface, that's easy. As we go to better uh, interfaces, you know, wherever you're describing a packet to uh, your interface subsystem, there needs to be a slot for a timestamp. So like, I'm working in the IETF and there's a working group called TAPS, which looks at this interface. And there we go away from the socket interface and rather look at like a message-based interface because that's what you usually need to do. So like what we have in this interface is giving like a latest timestamp basically. Like this is the latest point of time where the packet is still useful to send out. But we didn't consider like kind of what's the, what's the right point or like the earliest or whatever. So something we have to think about there. Um, yeah, so, I'm, this probably won't uh, answer the question, but um, this was an issue that came up, uh, sort of, what's the right service model in an IP-like protocol? See, so what was the right service model for IP to present to TCP? What was the right service model for an interface to pre present to IP? Uh, and uh, the thought behind best effort was stuff happens. And so anything tighter than that, unless you can handle a variable world, which is uh, things can get worse they, there's a limit to how much better they can get. Right? You can't uh, move things faster than the speed of light. Similarly, when you're queuing, you can say the earliest I want this packet to go out is now or sometime later than now, but you can't go back in time. You know, all your offsets, times can only get pushed in the future. Queuing is really asymmetric and packet interference is really asymmetric, which means that you can unambiguously say, this is the earliest this packet should leave. That is always meaningful. It says it's of no value if you send it before this time. But I have absolutely no say over whether you're going to have to send it later than this time, because that's not a choice you get to make. Uh, that's determined by sharing the links, other traffic conditions, interference. And um, in that philosophy, it's, it seems like there's only one reasonable choice for the timestamps that say, uh, this is the earliest it can go out, but in the best effort spirit, it can go out later than this. And there's no real constraint on how much later, except the fact that um, the departure time is determined by state in QDIS that was set by previous packets, means you could ask the question, if I gave you this packet, when would it hit the wire? Um, 
you can walk through all the QDISs. That's a read-only operation. Doesn't mutate state. Um, it's really cheap. You know, there's a chain of about you know n computation elements. They all look about the same. You know, ten or so, uh, and you get back a number that says, if you gave this to me, it's going to go out in 200 milliseconds. And say, oh, thank you very much. I'm going to do something else. Uh, so you can inspect the time really cheaply with this architecture, but you can't really control it. Just a quick, we should probably take this uh, offline, but like we look at the interface that is between like the transport and the application, and we have this deadline there because basically what you're saying is if you try to send this packet out after this deadline, the receiver will throw away it anyway. Like you can still send it out, or even if you send it before, it might be thrown away by the sender, but like after this deadline, no, like it's not useful anymore. That's the kind of deadline we have. In this. Okay. But it's something different, I understand. Yeah, we should take that offline. It's, it's a good discussion. Um, Tom Herbert. So um, stuff is great. I think the operative question from this audience would be, how do we get this into Linux? Uh, I think it's pretty painless. In fact, uh, I, so I, I think the short answer for a lot of these things, at least for us, is talk to Eric Dumaze and convince him that it should be in <laughs> Linux, and 12 hours later it's there. Uh, so uh, the answer for me is, Try and talk Eric into it. Uh, the, um, but I mean, then. So, so let me let me just throw <laughs> throw something out. So, it's a little bit unfortunate, but the term queuing discipline is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually a packet scheduler mechanism. I, we can do I, arbitrary things in queuing disciplines. So, for instance, implementing a carousel and a queuing, queuing discipline, putting the timer wheel there. If you do that, then instantaneously that would provide some level of um, granularity for the solution yeah. up to BQL, but for all drivers. Yeah. And then subsequently maybe figure out how to offload that functionality into devices. R right. So, uh, yeah, let me answer the right question, which is evolutionary strategy. So, if all packets are born with a timestamp that says send it now, which is AFAP, it's the current semantics, uh, then all of the QDIS that we have today work exactly the way they work now. No changes, because they're not going to mutate the timestamp. The stuff is going to show up at a driver with a timestamp that says, send it at earliest this time in the past, this time before FQ pacing saw it and held on to it for 10 milliseconds. So all the packets will go through the QDIS, which work the way they are now. Uh, get to a driver which, if the driver has been changed to run off the timing wheel, will say, okay, I can send this packet now because its timestamp is in the past. We'll ship out on the wire. Uh, so you don't have to evolve everything at once. If you can evolve a shim layer uh, sitting next to the driver output routine to handle the timestamps, leave all the QDISs intact, uh, then the semantics of timestamp starts saying, send it now. All this works. If you then start changing Q disks so that uh, if the timestamp is set, you follow a different path, uh, the computational part of a scheduling Q disk, but take out the scheduler part. Uh, so that would mean some parallel code and handling the two different paths and some memory of it, worst case. Uh, but it lets things coexist until you've changed everything and uh, stays backwards compatible until you've got enough change that you say, okay, let's finish it off. So, so there is one subtlety. Um, when you say that the driver is going to do something, uh, we have like, what, 200 uh, device drivers in Linux and we went through the BQL experience. It's a long path to make an update in each of So I think, like I said, the path is if we can start in the queuing discipline and then move down as like offload or acceleration, that's generally the kind of path. Um, but a separate question. So Carousel's been, I, I think, defined a while. And I know that at least at Google, there was some uh, experimentation with it. Has that uh, been converted to something that we could actually see in code? 
like a queuing discipline or something? Um, so uh, I'm not sure about the status of the carousel code, but um, I will ask about that. It's okay. an excellent question. There is a lot of uh, deployment measurements uh, and background given in the paper, not the implementation details because its deployment context wasn't the Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, I guess I would like to change that and I need to go back and ask how we would do that. Uh, at least come up with some kind of reference implementation. Uh, Eric is on, is on remote uh, and he wanted to say something. Eric? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, yes, yes. we can hear you. Yeah, so I was um, just very, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wanting to say that we were going to send a patch series converting TCP plus FQ to this new EDT model. Um, following the recent addition in Linux of ETF um, packet scheduler, uh, implementing not exactly the early departure time, but most the maximal time the packet is allowed to exit the host. But anyway, um, TCB will soon be converted to this new model, uh, allowing for better control by TCP of the best time to leave the host and subsequently to have a better RTT estimation. So it will probably help a lot, uh, at least the data center uh, communications. Cool. That's it. That's great news. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Haiyang Zhang. Uh, I have uh, one question is, uh, uh, do you do memory copy from your socket buffer to the timing wheel buffer? So is there any memory copy between the two? Uh, so no copies. The timestamps in the SKB, which is the buffer descriptor, mm -hmm. uh, so the the packet and the data is intact and modified. It's just that the description, systems description of the packet has a, pa a field that's giving the departure time. It only has local meaning. There's no reason for it to be in the packet. Okay. Uh, as I think Eric just said, right now we put what we hope is the departure time in TCP packets and quick packets. Say, well, here's we can't say the departure time, we don't know it. Uh, so we say, here's when the packet was built. If you have a scheduled system, then if you put the earliest departure time in the packet's timestamp field, you're expressing your intent, you're saying, well, this is when I wanted the packet to hit the wire. Uh, and what that means is any transport imposed delays uh, are included in that timestamp because you're saying when you want it to leave, but no system imposed delays, no contention or, or uh, sharing delays yeah. are included. Uh, so you can accurately measure uh, local delays in, in addition to all of the network delays. So it's a, it's a big step forward for timing. It makes things a, a lot more precise. It doesn't modify the packet. Uh, you don't have to if you match the user's intent if you send the packet when the user wanted to send it. Okay, and uh, my next question is, uh, you put a timestamp, so what's the precision required for the this timestamp? Is that uh, like a precision up to the microseconds or even more, or what's the precision of this time? Um, so, uh, the Ethernet evolution has taught us that uh, it's a mistake to pick a coarse time granularity. We thought that 10 milliseconds was good, and then we needed a millisecond, and then we needed a microsecond. Uh, now packets are uh, deep 
sub-microsecond, you know, 100 gig nick, they're 100 nanoseconds. So uh, we're pretty safe with nanoseconds that, that will take us up to the bandwidth limits of fiber, uh, which seems likely to be a pretty hard wall uh, for some time in the future. There's nothing in the model that puts a hard constraint on timestamp format, uh, because as you go across some boundary that wants two different timestamp formats, it's just an affine transform. You read a multiply plus an add to convert from one format to another. And uh, so you can avoid the multiply if you use the same resolution on both sides, and nanoseconds would do that today. Uh, and if we need something finer grain like picoseconds, then uh, we can buy into a multiplier or a shift as you cross a boundary to convert the old low res nanosecond timestamps to our super new high res. So it's not a showstopper. And too much of talk about timestamping has focused on synchronizing clocks and representing clocks, and it's a uh, it's a rat's nest. You you don't want to go there because it's really a non-problem. Uh, uh, thank you. Can, can I? Maybe we'll cut off the questions. I'm sorry, but unless you guys want to stay here for the break, I'm fine with it. You want to stay for the break in here? One guy said, "Yeah." Everybody. Yeah. Uh, people want to continue asking, Van. Okay. I think the majority are saying no. Sorry. So, but Van is gonna Van, you gonna be around for a while longer? Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot, Van. Appreciate it. Let's give him a round of applause. Mm -hmm.